Hey, folks of the web! How are you today? Hope all is good. Welcome back to my studio, Warsaw, Poland, and to my humble YouTube channel. My name is Paul. I'm good too, though I'm a bit tired, I have to tell you, because I have spent last four days on something pretty large and untypical. I have collected more than 200 home studio interfaces models from all the manufacturers and I've created a sheet listing all of them, all the basic parameters, prices and also some of my remarks and recommendations. Why did I do this? <laughs> I did it simply for you, because today I'd like to talk about choosing an interface for your home studio in 2022 and hoping that this vid and this sheet I'm gonna share with you is going to become your ultimate guide to home studio interfaces. Let's go! If you're planning to start any musical or audio business in 2022 and you're looking for a new interface, or if you're planning to upgrade, I do believe really that this video plus the sheet I've made for you are gonna help you out in making the right decisions. And yes, the sheet is available. You're gonna find the link in the description of this video. And it's just a public Google link, so go for it. It's for you. And yeah, you're gonna ask a question. More than 200 models, what should I choose? What decisions should I make? Well, we have to figure out a couple of things about you actually uh, and your studio. First thing is what's the purpose, what's the goal of what you do in your studio? Mm, what's your everyday activity in the studio? Are you recording large bands or just a solo acoustic or electric guitar or you're a guy with a couple of uh, synths like I am or maybe you just use only MIDI controllers and virtual instruments or maybe you're just only mixing and mastering music. Well, all that's gonna matter in the choices you're gonna make. The second very important thing, what's your budget? What's the amount of money you want to spend on it? There are more questions to come, but I think that the best way to start with all this is to run through all the possible analog and digital connections available in modern interfaces. What I'm gonna talk about right now is going to be pretty obvious for some of you, but please let me talk about it for a while because that's gonna be helpful for those of you who are not experienced enough and are just starting over. So first thing, connecting the interface to the computer. And that's a relatively easy thing because you've got limited choices here. You've got USB interfaces, USB 2 interfaces, USB 3 and the latest USB-C interfaces. The second option, which is kind of a thing of a past a bit, is Firewire. Well, I'm actually using a Firewire interface but I would not really recommend it as, as a future-proof choice because Firewire is the thing of the past. It's not supported anymore by motherboard producers, it's not being manufactured anymore, and there are less and less Firewire available units on the market. So please think about it twice when buying Firewire. The third option, and the really a cool one, and this is future-proof, is Thunderbolt. You've got Thunderbolt 1, 2, and three, and they are also backwards compatible, and there are more and more Thunderbolt units on the market, not only for Mac, but also for the latest PC Windows computers with proper motherboards are also perfectly capable of running Thunderbolt units. So the choice is yours, but if you ask me, the best, the most future-proof thing is going to be looking for USB 3 or C or Thunderbolt. That's pretty much about connecting your interface to your computer. And no, I did not include AVB, Dante, or Pro Tools HDX interfaces because these are typical pro audio large studio solutions. And I totally don't recommend them for your home studio. And maybe yeah, I'll drop another video on this separately. And now let's go to the audio connections, which is a really vast and rich world nowadays. 
analog audio connections. The first one is XLR. Yeah, you know it all. It's mainly for microphones and it can be 48 volts powered for condenser microphones, but it can also be line in. The second one you're surely familiar with is called TRS quarter inch jack and it's mainly line input for your synthesizers and other instruments and electronic audio devices. Both XLR and TRS are so-called balance connections. That means that there are two wires and a shield in each of the cables. The first uh, wire is running the signal, the second wire is running the same signal, but flipped 180% in phase. At the very end of the cable, uh, the phase is flipped again on one of the wires, so you get the signal that's twice stronger. The second plus is that all the interferences that might have appeared on the way are nulled and the signal is clean. There's also quarter inch TS tip and sleeve unbalanced cable and it's mainly for some other of your instruments like guitars and some of the synths that are not balanced. And well it's just one wire and the shield that runs as it is. Both quarter inch TRS and TS got their smaller versions but they are very very uncommon in pro audio equipment and interfaces. Another audio connection that's not too common but you still can see it on some interfaces is RCA change connection which is also unbalanced and looks like this. You also surely know it. And that would be it for the beginning. The set of audio analog connections I presented to you is more or less everything you're gonna meet and need in your everyday work. Let's go to the digital connections. And this area actually seems kind of a mysterious one even for some experienced studio people. So I hope to clarify a bit on this today. The first digital connection you should know is called ADAT Added Simply and it comes from Elise's Digital Audio Tape, a machine presented in 1991 by Elise's. And it used a Toslink optical cable to transfer purely digital data between devices. And since then became really popular among studio equipment producers to transfer audio data between different devices. ADAT is capable of transferring up to eight separate digital audio channels with different sample rates and bit rates. The second digital connection you should know because you're gonna meet it is called SPDIF. It stands for Sony Philips Digital Interface Format and it's capable of transferring digitally two channels of 24-bit audio with 48 kilohertz sample rate max so it's not as efficient as ADAT but still it's present on some models of interfaces and the main cable used for this is simply RCA change jack. There's also a pro-grade version of SPDIF, or should I say that SPDIF is a consumer-grade version of a connection called AES-EBU, which is also digital two-channel audio, RAM mainly or XLR cables with different electric properties than a regular XLR cable, you're gonna sometimes find also AES-EBU in your interfaces. The last digital connection you should know about is called Word Clock. It's a connection used to synchronize sample rates of different devices. You set one device as a master, you give it a sample rate and then you're gonna distribute the sample rate command to other devices. Usually word clock utilizes coaxial cable that you should also know as a so-called antenna cable. Hmm, is that all? Yeah, I believe that's all for the digital connections. And as I said before, no Denti, no AVB, no Mari, no Pro Tools HDX this time. It's a separate large story to talk about. Let's continue. And this is actually how you make a full spin while shooting a vid, guys. And I have always actually dreamed about it to show you the studio from all the possible angles at once. And I've made it finally. But you know what? Let's get back to our interface matters. And I've got the sheet in front of me. It would be cool if you opened it too. It's gonna help you. Because still we have to answer the question. What should I buy? 
here are the answers. And I'm actually having an extra look because I might have still missed something when talking to you. Yes, I should maybe mention 25-pin D-sub cable. You also know that cable and it works the way that you connect a breakout cable with proper tips or sockets and at the end of it. And that's it. It works like a separate line-in or mic-in cable or out cable as well. Mm, there are also some aux outs, sends, returns, inserts and stuff, but you know what, we're not going to get that much, that much into details because the video is going to get too long, definitely. As you can see, I have listed everything alphabetically. I listed the models, estimated prices, connectivity, maximum resolution, inputs, outputs, dynamic range and total harmonic distortion plus noise for the inputs and outputs. And maybe that's the thing I should talk about a bit. What is it actually? Does it matter? Yes, somehow it does matter. It doesn't tell you everything, but it's gonna give you the general overall image about the sound quality of the unit. The greater the dynamic range number, the better of course it is, because just in short, it's the difference between the noise and the signal. So 100 dBA, it's usually A-weighted measured. 100 dBA means there's the difference of 100 decibels between the noise and the signal on chosen inputs or outputs. 120 or 30 is, of course, even better. Same applies for ins and outs, of course. What is THD plus N? Well, this is total harmonic distortion plus noise and it's measured in a bit different way, in percentage sometimes, which means this is the overall amount of, well, total harmonic distortion and noise in proportions to your signal. And the lower this number is, the better, of course, it is. Sometimes it's also given in decibels, but it's not a weighted usually. As I said, it's not the most important feature of your equipment, but it's good to take a look at it sometimes because yes, it does matter. It's not everything, but it's good to know it. Then I've simply made a link to the manufacturer's website of the particular product. And then I gave you some remarks that are gonna help you make the right choice. And now we're gonna get back to our question. But what interface should I buy, Paul? Well, as I said in the beginning of this video, it depends on what you do and on your particular needs. And now I'm gonna try to describe a couple of possible scenarios to help you out with your decisions. First, let's assume you're a humble guy having just a MIDI controller and just producing your music with some VSTs. You don't need a large unit, right? But still, it's good to have like one or two mic preamps because you never know when you're gonna start recording vocals, for example. It's good to also have like two line-ins for your synth or anything else and a pair of outpu outputs plus headphones, right? That's gonna be it. And my recommendations for this would be, for example, Focusrite units. I'm also having a Focusrite in my second and third control rooms. And you know what? Focusrites are cool. They are reliable, they are not ruining your budget, and the price to quality ratio is really amazing with Focusrite. Scarlet third generation would be my pick if I were you. If you're tight on a budget, you can still go for Behringer, for example, which is reliable, works stable, doesn't have like amazing audio quality, but it really is still decent and you can trust it. And of course, some people are gonna hate Behringer. I get it, but please let me recommend it for people tight on budget. On the other hand, when you've got some more money to spend, well, you can go fancy. You can choose, for example, Universal Audio Vault or Apollo units, which sound great, are equipped with cool DSP functions and cool UAD plugins. Another option I would seriously consider is called Audient, my friends. And these are amazingly sounding, very high quality units that are also so not the most expensive ones. So yes, take a look at audience too. The second scenario I would predict is that you're mixing and mastering music strictly in the box. 
So you don't need any analog digital inputs, you just need outputs. Good to have more than one pair of outputs for different pairs of your monitors. That means you should keep your interface generally as small, as simple as possible. You can go, go also for DAC. A converter without any inputs like RME ADI series or something else, and I'm not gonna list them and describe them in this particular video, but also that would be a good option for you, my friend, maybe. If not, take an interface that's simple, minimal. You can go budget with Behringer, you can go Focusrite, you can go Moto, you can go RME or anything else. Just what your budget allows you to do, but keep it small, really. Another thing is when you're mixing and mastering out of the box or partially out of the box. That means that you're gonna make a chain of units or you're gonna make separate chains even of many units and that means that your interface should be at least medium size or a large one and you should definitely take a look at module offers they've got a lot of input output options per module they are very reliable and good sounding also rme should be your thing this is my personal recommendation yes i'm gonna repeat it i'm a happy user of rme unit okay what if you're a producer of both electronic and acoustic things and you simply need a lot of inputs for your guitars and synthesizers and your setup is pretty large. This is mainly my situation. Well, your interface of course should go big and you should balance the mics and line inputs uh, depending on your needs. Do you need more mics or do you need more electronic devices to be connected to your work environment? And you should definitely take a look at larger units with as many inputs and outputs as you might need. Also, this is the moment that ADAT kicks in. You should look for it if there are not enough physical analog inputs. You can have one ADAT or two ADATs. You have ADAT units with line-ins or mic-ins and you can connect them together with your interface. There are lots of ADAT options on the market. Mo2, RME, Audient, Universal Audio, you name it, they are all great. And also there are lots of great ADAT units by Focusrite, by Behringer, by Audient and by many, many other. That's your choice. The last scenario I can think of is that you're recording really, really large bands and, well, are you having really a home studio or is it a barn studio maybe? And then you should go for probably the largest options possible, depending on how many mic and line sources you're gonna need. And you know what? There are some really cool interfaces that you can configure yourself. Like Symphony I.O. by Apogee. There are different configurations. They are all available at the producer's website. Another choice would be links. Also great, great units. You can configure them yourself on the website of the producer. Not enough? Go Matrix Halo. Also, you can configure them to your liking and needs, but please remember these are only Mac units. You're not gonna run them with your Windows-based PC. Guys, what else? Huh, what else? There's a lot of it in this sheet and it's impossible to talk about it all at once in just one video. So you know what? We're just gonna make a run through my remarks in the table. Please remember, these are my personal views on things. I'm not saying that something's better or worse, but this is based on my experience. So maybe that's also kind of helpful for you. First thing is that I should also mention separately USB mixers. You're recording large or small live groups, well, a USB mixer with an interface is also a cool option for you. And yes, Alan and Heath is the one producing kind of many of them. Small, large, you name it, you choose from it. The second USB mixer's choice could be Mackie Onyx series, for example. Yes, I have been a user of Onyx. I was very, very happy with it, but I didn't need it. I used it on film sets to record audio. I quit the job and I didn't need it, so I simply sold it. It was an amazing quality unit with great sounding preamps. I loved it. 
another choice is Soundcraft. And well, this is my current um, USB multi-track mixer. It's called Signature MTK12. There's also a larger version and I couldn't recommend it more. It's really, really great. What's next? Well, there's Apogee and I have to mention it. Apogee is totally top sound quality. When you're not tight on budget and you want something that sounds amazing, it sounds the best, you should think about Apogee. Cranborn Audio, that's an interesting thing. It's an interface called 500R8. And you know what? You can include up to eight of your favorite 500 format modules to create your custom audio interface. This is amazing. I feel like trying it myself one day in the future, but I'm just letting you know that it's there and it's something untypical and cool. Let's go to Prism Sound. These units also offer pristine AD and DA conversion and they sound simply stellar. So if the quality is your thing, consider Prism Sound. RME, well, it's never enough to say that I've been a happy user of RME Fireface UFX unit. You know what? I bought it secondhand and it never broke. It's got full support from RME until today. It's got amazing function in, in its internal mixer. It sounds amazing and it's simply built like a tank and I love it. It's loved by the pros for a reason. This thing cannot break. It's amazingly functional. It sounds very, very good. Let's go on. Universal Audio. Yes, I told you about this before. There's a new Vault Cheaper series and there's Apollo series, which sounds amazing, especially the relatively new X Apollo series. It sounds amazing. The converters, preamps on these, are amazing. The last thing I should maybe mention is called Zoom. Yeah, Zoom makes interfaces, but you know what? Hmm, maybe one more uh, real life scenario. If you think our podcasts, well, Zoom will cover it for you. All the podcasters, please simply visit Zoom website to choose your device. You will surely find it there. And I think that's it for today, guys. <sighs> this video is gonna be probably really, really long, but you know what? It's one of these long-term projects, not a video to be seen in a week or so. So I really do hope it's gonna serve you for coming weeks and months to make the right choices when choosing an interface or upgrading from a current one. And guys, please take a look at my sheet. Maybe some of my recommendations and all my talk is gonna be uh, somehow helpful for you and yeah remember it's always a good time to buy an interface or to upgrade because doing sound and music is well one of the most beautiful things in life don't you agree stay cool stay positive create beautiful things and be back soon take care <laughs>